Hey guys, welcome to part two uh, of the business studies lecture. We're now going to focus on marketing. Um, marketing is one of my passions. I love, love, love it. I'm actually studying for it as we speak now. Today is Monday and on Friday I have a marketing exam, which I haven't started studying for. So let's pump through this. This might even be some revision for me. Um, I was doing my university course, uh, doing my university course, I've realized how much actually does relate to marketing and, and business studies in general. So don't forget that, you know, studying today is going to help you in the future, um, continuing on. So don't forget it. it might seem a bit daunting. All right, let's punch through marketing. So what is marketing all about? Marketing is about developing, promoting um, your product, making sure you're getting the right price and distribution to the right people. It's all about generating that sales revenue and profit. It's almost a lot of people realize that, you know, without actually marketing the product, even if you have the best product in the world, no one's going to know about it. So you really need to focus on these marketing strategies. Again, strategic role is about the long term. So in marketing's goal, what is the purpose of marketing? Um, a good example again here would probably be Apple. Think about their marketing strategy. It's almost timeless. Their marketing has been since their you know development in like 1997 has been iconic. It's been you know really really clean and simple, really um, I guess fashionable um, as well as really innovative. It, and it's always been like that. And I don't think anyone could probably think of a time when an Apple ad wasn't good. Um, and or didn't meet, meet that strategic idea. And, and that's, there you go, a good example of where strategic role and thinking about the long-term strategy of your company's marketing um, perspective needs to be considered. Um, now, in order to do it, there's three marketing uh, approaches. Now, I often like to associate this with almost like a little history lesson. Um, so think about it as your, is in your family's aspect. So back in the day, um, when you you know your grandma was in her prime, um, it was all about production. Companies focused on producing the best or the, the highest quality product, um, and just they thought, you know what, if we make a product and it's good quality, people will buy it. That was the marketing mentality back then. It's now since moved to then selling. Selling is more like again when your parents were in their prime, it was more about advertising and you know having promotions and convincing so do you remember those like seeing those you know old school ads where it's like um you know like do you, do you suffer from chronic back pain then you'll love this new product blah 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 so selling was more about advertising the product it was because at that time when your parents were in their prime they kind of realized that look we need to differentiate ourselves we need to advertise our product so people know our product exists in the market Nowadays, though, we use the new marketing approach. That is, we need to meet customers' needs. It's all about matching the wants and the needs to the product's features and, um, and desires. So we need to also be more competitive and affordable. So as you can see, over time, we've changed our strategy. We've moved from production, we've moved to then selling, and now we're in the marketing phase. Um, and over time, this is really what's changing how marketing has evolved and, and how we operate. There are four different types of markets here. That is the resource, industrial, intermediate and consumer markets. The resource market is where you get your raw materials and your products. So we're talking steel, iron, you know, iron ore, that kind of thing. Industrial is those goods that are used as supplies in the production process. So for example, uh, glass. Intermediate is those resources or th those suppliers who really don't do anything. They just wholesale, buy the products in bulk, and then they, they don't manufacture or touch them, they just store them, and then they then wholesale, on sale it onto other people. So they're just almost like an intermediate middleman. Um, and the last market is then the consumer market, that is you and I. Now there's either the mass, segment, or niche. To explain this, let's, have a, let's go through a quick example using Holden cars. So first resource market would be something like aluminium. Next industrial market would then be the wheels from Dunlop. The intermediate market might be like, you know, the sales reps or something like that and the dealerships. And that kind of links then to our consumer markets where the Holden dealership will, ma will market our products accordingly. Now, for example, if we have a look at these three models down the bottom here, Holden Captiva is a mass market product. It can fit everyone, families, single mums, soccer mums, it can meet single men, you know, it kind of is a mass market product. It kind of fits everyone. 
the Holden Spark, maybe more younger demographic, you know, pink cars for females, that kind of thing. It's more of a younger, so they've segmented their market there according to age and gender demographic. The Holden Vault is really a niche market. That's a small, tiny segment of a segment. So it's really, really niche. That is maybe like, you know, tech heads, you know, those people that love Teslas, that kind of thing. They would fit in this niche market here. Next, what are some factors that influence our consumer choice? We look at psychological, sociocultural, economic, and government. So these all influence our consumer choice, the ability for us or for me to pick one product from another. So, you know, my motivation and personal characteristics will determine, you know, whether or not I'll go buy from Woolworths or whether or not, you know, I don't mind, I'll go buy from Aldi. It's a really good store. That psychological aspect will influence you. Um, sociocultural is pretty much in the name. It's what society influences and what cultural influences. That is your values, your beliefs, your customs. So, for example, here, McDonald's in Australia might serve chips with their meals. Whereas overseas, they might serve rice or they, you know, might alter the products that are available at the time. Next is economic. That is your income level, job type, educational level. You know, the more money you earn, the more money you're naturally going to be spending, the higher you will justify paying for a higher quality product. So, you know, think about the difference between, you know, a lawyer going and buying a car versus maybe, you know, just a labourer or a tradie going to go buy a car. There'll be, you know, different products, different markets, different consumer choices there. Last but not least is the government, without a doubt, do influence our consumer choices. They use fiscal policy, that is their budgets. They use monetary policy, which is their interest rates set by the RBA. And they use taxes as well to influence our purchasing behaviour. So for example, cigarettes, they're just getting more and more and more expensive and that influences our consumer choice because of taxes. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll influence whether or not we go buy, whether or not we continue to smoke, whether or not we change our brands of cigarette packets, that kind of thing. Um, marketing is influenced as well by a lot of consumer laws. So the Competition and Consumer Act here is again key and it's where it controls and does not allow misle uh, misleading and deceptive advertising, we also don't allow price discrimination, which is charging a different price to different customers. We also have to imply certain warranties and conditions, that is refund or exchange if faulty, as well as resale price maintenance. That is, two suppliers can't get together and start charging the same thing. So, for example, if Apple sells an iPhone retail price for $1,000, they can't enforce JB Hi-Fi and say, you must sell this product for at least $1,000. They can't do that. Same idea where companies can't also price collaborate, um, which is where they one company will talk to the other competitor and be like, you know what, I won't charge more. I will charge $10, which is inflated price. If you charge $10 as well, they both agree so that they, they can captivate the market. Very, very uh, illegal and unethical. Again, ethics is covered under truth and accuracy. You know, having good taste. A lot of ads get a lot of backlash for bad taste. So um, a lot of people criticise the lamb ad because it, whilst it was trying to maybe portray multiculturalism, it maybe wasn't as effective or as sensitive as it needed to be. Um, so you need to make sure you know, you're know not looking at, you know, um, I guess sexuality, naked, people on screen, you know, McDonald's appealing to kids through Happy Meals for the toy, that kind of thing. Got to be very careful there. Um, you've also got to be ethical about products that damage health. So, you know, we don't really see advertisements because it's illegal for cigarettes. Alcohol kind of plays a blurred line where they use, you know, like women and, and sexuality um, in order to really try and push their, their agenda. Again, somewhat unethical. Same with gambling and, and, and horse racing and the Melbourne Cup coming up, those kind of things. You know, be very careful about the ethical and legal comp uh, implications in your marketing um, strategies and ads. We also must employ fair competition where we legally regulate um, price fixing, which is what we are talking about before, those long-term cost leaders um, as well, and misleading advertisements. A good example here is think about um, how Coles and Woolies did that down, down, prices are down, you know, Coles milk, only a dollar a litre milk, crazy, crazy price grab. Think about the poor farmer. Think about, you know, the local corner store that sells milk at the higher price. For them, they're um, going to be suffering a lot in competition. That's because Coles and Woolies are employing a long-term loss leader strategy. 
That is, in the long run, Coles know that they're not making any money on the milk. In fact, they're probably losing money. The reason they do it is because it tracks consumers to the store and they go and buy other things anyway. So they're not, whilst yes, they might be losing on one product, milk, they're gaining profit everywhere else because the customer's coming into the store to buy it. Lastly is uh, sugging, so selling under the guise of market research. That is when, you know, someone calls you and be like, oh, you know, just doing a survey to see uh, how much are you paying for your internet connection right now? And if someone says something like, you know, 80, 90, $100, whatever, oh, did you know that Optus actually sell it for $60 a month? A lot cheaper than what you're paying at the moment. So that's where, whilst they initially began selling as market research, it then turned into a sales pitch. So that's, again, unethical. Now, in terms of the process of marketing, we need to undertake a couple of things in order to really see what's going on in the market. That is, we look at a SWOT. Uh, that's a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now, strengths and weaknesses are those internal in the company, and opportunities and threats are those external to the company. So let's go through them, some examples. A strength might be, I have really good staff. A weakness might be, you know, our machines are getting old. They're things that we can control. They're things that we can improve ourselves. Opportunities and threats are some things we can't. They're external to us. So because of that, you know, an opportunity might be, you know, um, there is a global financial crisis. I can't control that, but it's something that I do need to, you know, keep an eye on. Lastly, a threat. A threat is something that, uh, oh, sorry, my apologies. A threat would be the global financial crisis because it's a negative uh, influence on the, on the business. An opportunity, on the other hand, is something where we can build upon our strengths. So something more like, um, you know, global retail sales is increasing worldwide. So that's good because it means for retail stores, we can earn more money. You know, global trends are proving to be, you know, profitable and successful. Uh, in terms of the business life cycle, there's four distinct stages that a company goes through. So it goes through establishment, which is where, you know, the company is starting off low sales, but, you know, Got to be careful there, very risky stage. Growth is when we see the maximum sales, you know, we're like looking at maximizing as much as possible. That growth trend is huge. Maturity is when it kind of flat lines, you know, the product is well known by now and it, it, the product sales and profits flat line. Um, what we have to be careful from this point onwards is that we don't go into post maturity in a negative post maturity. So often what will happen is we will decline in production and in sales, and then the product ceases altogether. Whereas we need renewal. So a good idea here is think about the iPhone. In establishment, it grew huge. In growth, again, growing, growing, growing. The iPhone first generation hit maturity and died off. Now what Apple did is they renewed. They then introduced a new product in order to hit that renewal phase, and again, it continues up and goes up. And that's why every year you see a new iPhone because it continues that renewal phase. What they're trying to avoid is either steady state or decline and cessation. Next is market research. Now, we, when we're collecting market research, we need to look for primary and secondary sources. Primary sources are those collected for a specific purpose. So if I'm doing a survey response to see how university students respond to you know phone plans then I need to and I'm collecting that myself or for that specific purpose that's a primary source a secondary source on the other hand is just other already existent materials so for example if I'm looking at maybe like um, you know how many students are going to uni I might look at the births um, rates, uh, the birth rates, the death rates, that kind of thing provided through the ABS. I might also look at government documents, at company magazines or industry magazines, books, figures on the internet, that kind of thing. They're statistics or information that's already been collected for another purpose, but that relates to your current um, marketing research idea. Next is your marketing objectives need to be smart. That is specific, clear and precise, measurable so that we can actually check our process and procedure. It needs to be achievable. We must be able to actually you know, achieve it. It must be something that resources are available to have in existence so that we can actually do it. It also must be realistic. Now, if your boss sets you a goal that's not realistic, you're not gonna be wanting to go and do it. So it's pointless setting that goal. Next is time bound. You need to really focus on being, um, you know, having a, having a fixed time frame. There's no point in saying, all right guys, let's improve sales by 10% and ending it there. You need to really have a time frame on it so that 
there's a need, there's an urge, there's a feeling that we need to get this done by this date. We need to set that goals well. Um, some common goals there that are oh, objectives are increasing our market share, expanding into new markets, as well as increasing the number of products that we offer in the market. Um, now again, the target markets, who we're targeting, same as before, mass, segment, and niche. So let's go through an example here. The target, if you've got a mass target market and we're looking at the milk example, you might be looking at just you know, fair, fat, uh, like normal full cream milk. That's a mass market product. A segmented product might be light milk. That is for people that are just health conscious, we'll segment it for them. Whereas a niche product might be something like, you know, those low fat, no fat, full high fiber, you know, um, uh, certain like those vegetarian options, like all those kind of things. That's what we're talking about here. So one product category will be targeted and, and, and individualized depending on the type of market that you're kind of going for. So um, target markets also help us make sure we're meeting the most number of people in the most effective way possible. Next is, again, market objectives. That's where we're looking at product, price, promotion, and place. And you guys have probably heard this a million times. Just remember them. I'm not going to go through them, but you probably already know it. So not that, uh, not that new there. Now, in terms of the process, you've got to implement it, put it into practice. You've then got to monitor it, control it, and revise it. And this applies to any business topic and any business strategy in general. So obviously, once you put it into practice, we need to monitor it. How do we monitor it? Well, you look at sales analysis. That is looking at how much sales we're making in certain departments. We look at market share analysis. That is comparing certain sales and strengths and weaknesses against certain other competitors in the business. And then you also look at market profitability. That is, are you profitable in the business? Is there a cost benefit analysis here? In terms of controlling, it's looking at comparing your planned and actual results, making changes if necessary. And in terms of revising, we're looking at over time, can we make these strategies better? What do we need to change to make these more effective? All right, let's punch into these marketing strategies. That is, in marketing segmentation, we need to segment our market according to certain customer types in order to meet them most effectively. How do we do this? We look at four different scales. We look at geographic, where do they live, what country, what suburb. We look at demographic, what's their age, gender, income. We look at psychographic, what's their lifestyle like, are they, what are their personalities like, what are their values and interests. And lastly, behavioural. What, how often do they purchase? What benefits do they want from the products? How often do they use the product? How loyal are these customers? If we're able to segment our market into these segments like this, we are able to then target them because we know exactly what they want. Now, in theory, this works. In practice, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But theoretically, we're able to really understand who our customers are, why they buy our products, when and where from, and we're able to get all of this understanding by segmenting them and targeting different products to suit them. All right, next is differentiating and positioning. So this is when we differentiate our product, we make it as different as possible, we distinguish it with features, and then we position it in a way to suit that target market. So for example, Qantas really do go for that upper class market, Whereas Tiger Air and Jetstar go for that budget traveller who don't need all the luxuries, they don't need that personalised service, they just want that price competitive nature. All right. Now, the four strategies, product, price, promotion and place. Again, you guys have really gone through this as well. Um, so product is all about positioning. How is your company, brand or product perceived in the mind of a consumer. When I think of BMW, I think high luxury. When I think of Apple, I think innovative. When I think of Tiger Air, I think budget airline, maybe not the best service, but it is cheap. You know what I mean? Those kind of things. How is your product positioned in the mind of your customers? Packaging. 
What's the physical appearance of your good and product? For a lot of people who purchase Apple products, it's that unboxing experience that they really, really love. So many customers come into work and you know, I'm opening up their brand new iPhone, they're like, no, 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 I wanna open it. They really love that, that experience, as crazy as it might seem. Apple have really got that packaging really down, you know, the slow release of the iPhone box, really, really cool. Um, just things like that really do influence the product, the price, um, and, and the perception of your product. Next is branding, that is the reputation of your company using brands and logos and, and, and um, company names, that kind of thing. It sets an expectation as well. Now there is so many different pricing strategies that a company can pick from. There's penetration pricing where you start from the lowest possible price to get a real good hype at the start. There's that lost leader, like we're talking about Coles markets um, for, for milk. There's product deletion pricing, that is reducing the price of old stock in order to make way for new stock. So for example, you know how you see like the um, run out plate sales for Ford and Holden. So when the new year model comes out, they're selling the older model for $3,000 less, for example. There's also market skimming, where you charge the highest price of the product to get that high, um, you know, high market cost there. Demand base is where you look at high demand, meaning higher pricing. Prestige pricing is where you charge really like prestigious pricing. You charge that higher price because you want to get your brand to be well known. Again, this can't be something that you do just straight off the bat for a new company. Prestige pricing can only be built up over time. For example, BMW. Cost plus pricing is probably the most common. It's where you say, okay, I want my profit margin to be maybe 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever it is. And then you add the cost of profit on top of that. Competition based is when you look at what your competitors are doing price wise and you do those price beat guarantees. So for example, Bunnings having that 10% or will beat it. Price points is having certain different products available to suit different price levels. So for example, whilst Qantas might offer you know, budget price tickets, economy, they also offer first class, business class, space saver, all those kind of things. So different flight levels will target different price levels for different types of consumers. Lastly is psychological pricing. Now you can't believe how much this works. Psychological pricing is instead of selling a product say at $100, you sell it at $99.95 because then the customer really thinks it might be $90 when actually it's closer to the $100 price point. In perfume, this used to be huge. People used to think, oh, you know, the bottle's only what, 90 or so dollars? It's actually 100, but people remember that first digit more so. So that's why. Same with fuel, when you go to per fill up your car, it's always like $1.19, 0.99 or 0.95, they get that because it makes you feel like, oh yeah, it's cheaper, it's not a dollar twenty, it's a dollar something, it's a dollar, you know, it's not a dollar twenty, not a dollar thirty, it's a lot cheaper. So psychological pricing works crazily there. Next is promotion strategies. That is taking that personal selling approach where you take that business to the customer, for example, Tupperware parties that your mum goes to. Um, next is like relationship marketing where, you know, if you refer a friend, you get a discount, they get a discount. Next is advertising. That is using like TV promotions, marketing online, that kind of thing. Sales promotions is where you do competitions or discounts in order to get um, sales through the door. So for example, for end of financial year, Optus did a massive 25% off sale where you get 25% off and if you recommend a friend, they get 25% off. It was huge. So many customers coming through the door. Really, really good marketing strategy there. Next was publicity. That is, think about um, events that are advertised using companies. So for example, the Bathurst V8 1000, uh, sorry, the V8 Bathurst 1000. The biggest um, marketing company, company with that is Super Cheap Auto. In fact, whenever you hear it, it's always called the Super Cheap Auto Bathurst 1000. You know, it's, it's the, that brand awareness there is huge because of that publicity event. Next is opinion leaders. That's when we're using those YouTubers, those vloggers, those celebrities to give you that good reputation and brand. And last but not least, word of mouth. It is huge. Word of mouth it really talks about customers referring one another to products. And it's really uncontrollable because if you've got bad word of mouth going out online, how are you meant to control a million customers complaining about your product or service? So you really need to be careful with word of mouth. Often with word of mouth, companies or sorry, uh, consumers who have a bad experience, they'll tell everyone about the bad experience. If they have a good experience, they might only tell one or two other people, but it's those bad experience people that outweigh the good experience and that you really need to be careful of. 
Next is place. That is how are you distributing your products? What channel choices are you using? And do you have any physical distribution issues like transport, warehousing, inventory, managing all of that? Um, channel choice is the most important one here. That is how are you making your product available to consumers? Are you an intensive strategy where it's, you know, Smith chips, they're available everywhere. Are you doing selective strategies where, you know, you're only allowing this product to be available at certain stores and locations? Or are you doing exclusive where you yourself only control it? Good example here is think about car manufacturers. Now, cars, Holdens, you can pretty much buy them from, you know, limited stores and locations. They're pretty available. You know, there'd be selective strategy. Tesla, on the other hand, the electric car manufacturer, is completely exclusive. They themselves have select dealerships that they own and run. They're not a franchise. They run the dealerships themselves, unlike any other car manufacturer. That's very exclusive. It kind of gives you that new kind of sales pitch and strategy there. Now, the other P's are people, processes, and physical evidence. They form up um, to make the seven P's in marketing. Now, people obviously getting the right people hired. Processes is all about getting that experience before and after the sale to make sure that the process and procedure is as effective and as good as possible. Physical evidence is those things that the customer gets during the sales process that they get to physically keep. That is the packaging, the bag, the quality items, the support team, those kind of physical evidence ideas that the customer will remember. So when you think about Apple, think about the packaging, think about the Apple Genius Bar experience, think about all these different things. Next, e-marketing, obviously huge. Use your online marketing presence, very, very important. And again, global marketing. Now, a lot of companies can either use a standardized or a differentiated approach. That is, with a standardized approach, it's like Coke. They use the same logo, the same name, the same branding everywhere they go. Um, whereas differentiation approach is where they adjust the product, the marketing, the brand, the name in order to suit different countries or areas. What you have to be careful of with the standardized approach is that yes, it's cheaper, it's quicker, it's effective. The only problem is, is let's say you translated your company name from English to you know Chinese or something like that and the translation doesn't make sense or it's inferior or it doesn't um, you know, meet cultural values, then you know, you're gonna suffer. So you have to be careful. The, whether or not you use a standardized or a differentiated approach depends on the type of product and the market and the type of countries you're going into. Um, that's it, that's strategies, marketing strategies done. Very, very simple, very easy. Um, with marketing, I really love a bit of creativity in my responses, we'll go through it in the end, but really hone down those marketing strategies well and again link the ideas as much as possible all right we will see you in finance now a lot of people struggle with this one trust me you're going to be fine we'll see you in the next video